I'm, I'm pleased to be here again and see so many friends. Um, we have a very interesting panel here about dispute resolution, I, I have to say. You all know these long nights of contract negotiations uh, where all sorts of commercial issues in a contract are, are negotiated maybe by the commercial teams or by, by the M&A lawyers. And shortly before um, midnight, before the signing of the contract, someone comes up with the question, oh, by the way, do we have a dispute resolution clause? And people would answer, yes, of course, we do have a standard dispute resolution clause. But unfortunately, five years down the line, when the contract becomes subject of a dispute, people will realize that the standard dispute resolution clause was not the best thing uh, that, that was done in this contract. So what I want to say is dispute resolution is an important topic, and not only once a dispute has arisen, but you need to deal with that proactively already when you negotiate a contract. Now, some 20 years ago, dispute resolution was basically done in the state court. It's a burdensome process, state court litigation, and that's why arbitration has been developed as as a very important means of, of dispute resolution, in particular, of course, when it comes to international contracts, to international disputes. Not so much when it comes to a domestic dispute, perhaps, these days. Now, in, in this session, we're going to explore a few issues in relation to arbitration in India and how these should be dealt with in the future in order to become even more efficient in the area of dispute resolution. And I'm really delighted to have such a distinguished panel uh, of speakers here. Um, in alphabetical order, Mr. Advani, senior partner, Advani and Co. Mr. Chandruk, former additional solicitor general of India. Mr. Chandru, partner specialized in dispute resolution at Rodaik in Singapore. And Mr. Gopalakrishnan, group head, legal operations and human resources at asset reconstruction company. India. Now the structure of the session will be that um, I would ask each of the panelists to do a brief introduction on one topic that they have been assigned before, they could prepare before, and I would like to ask you not to exceed eight minutes, and we have very strict timekeepers, I know, I know them from previous conferences, so you'd better adhere to the eight minutes rule. Um, and then hopefully we'll have enough time uh, for you to ask questions or make comments on the presentations that we had. Now, with this short introduction, Mr. Mr. Chandyuk, I would like to ask you the first question, because you're clearly a leading arbitration specialist in the country. We have heard a lot of criticism of how the Indian courts deal with, Indian, uh, uh, with arbitration related cases. But we have also seen in the last two or three years that there has been quite some progress and development in the state courts. And I would like to ask you, how has this development taken place? What is the current state of play uh, of the Indian state courts when it comes to arbitration-related cases? Uh, Bisham Pitamas of arbitration sitting in the audience who would probably be able to do that, but I must accept a position that this perception that we are probably not handling in India international arbitrations or domestic arbitrations properly is not correct. If you take this basic arbitrations in India is in metropolitan places like Delhi, Bombay, Madras. In fact, if I see these statistics available with me, Delhi tops the list. Now, if that I see that I, even if I just give you the idea of the last three months, with two exclusive judges today sitting in the Delhi High Court doing only arbitrations. There's a disposal of over 300 cases in the last three months. So both Section 9 as well as 34, we have some areas, if you recall, prior to Balco coming in, there were some disputes that we had on international arbitration which got resolved by Balco. I do not know whether it's right or wrong, but the fact is people think that we have resolved it. I had in fact uh, suggested as a law officer of the country also that we need in India two separate arbitrations that we have in Singapore, that one domestic and one international, so that the, this whole thing going from part one to part two should be done away with. But it has so far not happened. We were expecting a 
ordinance, which probably will probably now get in this session. I am expecting the, the law minister said he's probably wanting to introduce it in this session. By that, we'll have to regulate certain portions of the Arbitration Act, where we're looking at basic problem in Delhi is arbitration has seen lately is with respect to the fees of the arbitrations, though we don't take that look at that when we go to other parts of the world, but in India we do take that note of it. Therefore, there is a regulation on that. But so far as arbitration is concerned, those disputes have been ironed out. We have been able to do take our plunge to it. The arbitration is taking its position in India. And if all of us join our hands and have people who only deal in arbitration, our problem is ad hoc arbitration. We are looking if we can bring that institutional mm -hmm. arbitration into this country. We have now arbitration centers in Delhi, even including one next to the High Court. We hope on the institutional arbitration takes a state and we are able to bring that, things will be more smooth than we have today. But my request is only this, that this lot of perception amongst us that probably we delay every matter. You saw Daniel asking me what is the time duration for a civil court to take place. In civil court litigation today, unfortunately, if you see that statistic in the last five years, we don't get many commercial disputes coming to the courts now. Actually, it is family disputes, disputes to properties, disputes after we have got that section 14, etc. of the women's right to the co-personary properties have come in. They are wanting to reopen those chapters. Now, when the emotions get attached to law, obviously it takes some time. And therefore, we established a mediation center in Delhi. That mediation center, I'm proud to tell you, handles 85 to 90 cases a day. And each of those cases are handled by lawyers, most of them pro bono. That is where we are adding to ensure that we are able to settle it. 62 to 65 percent cases are settled there. Sometimes we take the aid of the same and take it to an arbitrator to get a result. So it's not a case where we are not looking at arbitration. The only thing we are looking now in the international community is to have faith that India can be a better venue, not only Singapore, Dubai, or for that matter, Paris or London. So with this, I'll answer all your questions. So I thought the impact is today, even litigation, if you see on the original side of Delhi, is gone down. We have been, our output is much more than what we have intake today. So all that perception that it takes about 10 years for a case to be decided on the original side is not correct. We have been able to expedite our matters. We have been able to look at the rules. We have been able to look at how many appeals should go forward. And all this is added to it after the Supreme Court judgment by the Constitution bench, though of course it says it's prospective. But many of those principles are applicable even with respect to the arbitration spending or the agree agreements that are there. But the unfortunate part is the drafting part, which is still, I feel, needs an attention. I think it was very right when he said that, because to have an arbitration which says I'm governed by Indian law as the underlying contract, then I say the arbitration would be governed by the English Arbitration Act. The curial law shall be then ancestral law. The place of arbitration shall be militia. And then it says you will not claim anything inconsistent with Indian law. That's where the drafters of the agreements need to be more careful what we are doing. Thank you so much. All of us who have been familiar with arbitration <coughs> have seen the problems over years um, with the arbitrators in particular, <coughs> and of course the slow process of arbitration and the courts. Um, I think the new amendment uh, has made a serious attempt to make some improvements and some serious improvements in the Arbitration Act. Uh, by amending it, but you've got to remember the Act was 1996 based on a union trial model, and right from 2000, a large number of people felt there are lacunas in the Act. So there have been four previous attempts to amend the Arbitration Act, all unsuccessful. Let's hope the latest one is now successful. There was talk about putting it as an ordinance, but obviously there were too many ordinances flying from the government and. They decided to hold back and actually go for the amendment. Um, not at all sure when the amendment will, will take place. We were told by the law commissioner himself, the chairman of the law commission, Mr. Ajit Shah, that in fact it's going to happen in this budget session, but I'm not sure about whether it's going to happen in this budget session. Um, the interesting thing was that some of us who do arbitration interacted a lot with Mr. Shah while he was doing this amendment. And he was, of course, the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. He was not in the Supreme Court. And very interestingly, he could say that for the first time I can say, okay, overrule this Supreme Court judgment, overrule this Supreme Court judgment, over the next one, 
And basically what the amendments are trying to do, they in fact overturned several judgments, previous judgments of the Supreme Court, which had caused consternation in the arbitration community and we're not happy with. I mean, the first one that is on section two, they widened the scope of parties so that it's not only a signatory to the agreement, arbitration agreement, but anyone claiming through the signatory can also be made a uh, party to the arbitration. This has been a controversial aspect globally because should only signatories be made or if there are group companies involved, should the entire, if there are other companies involved, should the group companies be involved in the arbitration or if they're related companies, should they be involved because very often the projects are done by special purpose vehicles, sometimes very small, sometimes will not get enforcement. It's been a big, big issue and one of our judgments of the Supreme Court, very progressive looking, Clora Control said yes, we can make anybody claiming to the party, but only for international arbitrations and for some reason not for domestic arbitration. The Arbitration Amendment Act makes that the first change. It says that even in domestic arbitration, even if a party is not signatory to the agreement, um, you can join them, provided they're claiming to a party and their association is uh, close enough with the, with the dispute. Uh, we think that goes um, a long way and it's very progressive and I'm sure it'll be, uh, go a long way in helping when you have small, small companies, particularly companies which have been set up as special purpose vehicles and not involving the parent company, so you can involve the parent companies, particularly for enforcement. The other issue was constantly worrying us was if you filed a suit and you made non-parties to the arbitration, or non signatories to the arbitration agreement, parties to the suit, the Supreme Court in the several judgments, particularly Sukanya, took a view then these can't be referred to arbitration because these are not signatories to arbitration. And standard practice was to very simply make other parties to the suit and so you defeat the purpose of arbitration. The arbitration agreement says no. If those parties are not necessary parties, the suit can still be referred to arbitration. So um, it goes a long way in taking care of some of those. There were issues on section nine and section 17 which basically deal with interim orders. And you had almost a parallel process going on, whether you could go to court for interim orders or go to the arbitrators for interim orders. Section 17 has now been broadened up and all the powers under section nine are now given to the arbitrators. It's made an enforceable order and, and very sensibly said that, look, once the arbitration starts, you can no longer go to section, section nine. Please go under section 17 to the arbitrators and get whatever relief you want from them and don't keep burdening the court with more and more of these issues. Um, so um, it'll go a long way to take off the burden in court. And like my learned friend was saying earlier that section nine and 34 are being disposed by two judges of the Supreme Court, uh, two judges of Delhi High Court and being done quite rapidly. Taking section nine away from the court because the less cost interference, the better you off you will be usually. Um, some of the other amendments is um, Literally, section 28 is amended because the saw pipes judgment, again, called out of disquiet saying, you have to follow the contract um, and say the exact letter of the contract has to be followed, otherwise the courts can set aside. And we know how liberally the courts in India set aside arbitration agreements. Exceedingly liberally entertain all kinds of challenges and all kinds of courts all over the place. That has now changed and said the arbitrator will have regard to the terms of the contract. Uh, yes, he bound by have regard to the terms of contract. He's appointed in the contract, but uh, hopefully gives it less room for challenge in the future, which is the challenge to the arbitration. And talked about, um, because we have, the issue is standard all over the world. It's um, public policy. That's the only reason you can challenge an award. But public policy in India has been uh, interpreted so liberally by our courts that it can mean anything. In fact, in a very, very recent judgment of the Supreme Court, they said apply any kind of standards, even Wensory principles, administrative law standards, to see whether the arbitration award is good or not. I mean, that's just blowing a hole into the whole concept of arbitration and telling the courts free run, whatever award you think you don't like, dislike, please set aside, because I'll apply administrative principles now to see whether or not the awards are good. So, there has been an attempt to tie it up, try tidy it up, and the um, amendment says that only if there are serious, serious issues of public morality 
or justice and public morality that offends your senses. I mean, it's so strong that um, only then set aside the award. Don't go into the minutiae of the award to dissect it and see the, what the judge would have done. It's very difficult for a judge. We understand that the judge normally has control of his proceedings. He acts according to his conscience. He does his duty, he does his <coughs> duty very, very dutifully and looks into the minutiae of the issue. Now to tell him an arbitration award, sorry, the principles are somewhat different. That was the arbitrator's job. This is no longer your job. You just see if there are very, very serious, there's some gross errors in the award, then go into it. The judges don't seem to be detached themselves from that. So <clears throat> you will still have an issue, whatever definitions you put in. We've had it, two separate definitions for international arbitration and for domestic arbitrations. They've added the concept of patent illegality for domestic arbitrations. And the justification, the answer to that was probably because the domestic arbitrations do seem to have a different standard when they operate. Uh, there are different standards of um, corruption, et cetera, which go along. So they added an issue of um, patent illegality. Um, does that open the door wider or not? Um, time, will, time only will tell. The attempt was to uh, tighten it and not to permit future challenges. But um, like I said, any definition you put, ultimately the Supreme Court will look at the issues and set the tone. Um, you know, the issue is today when clients come to us, what do we tell them if they're foreign clients? We say, for God's sake, don't arbitrate in India. There must be something wrong if you want to arbitrate in India because the quality of the arbitrators is not very high. They have piecemeal hearings spread over the years. And I appreciate what felt from my learned court, from my learned friend that the Delhi High Court is now progressively trying to expedite everything and all that. So does the amendment do that. They say under section 34, please try and complete the challenges in one year. So which was the biggest, biggest stumbling block because you were not so much worried about the challenges because we have good judges, very capable of judges, but the time it took. Um, in Bombay High Court, um, at least three years, four years for a challenge under 34, one round of appeals, then you go to the Supreme Court. And I know that what learned friends said, no, 10 years is not true. I agree with them, it's not true. It's usually more than 10 years. It's not going to be less. By the time you take it from the High Court to the Supreme Court, it's a long way. For international arbitrations. Awards are now presently being challenged before district courts. The district courts have very, very little experience of it. And usually you'll find they will hear you for days and days on end and refuse to give a judgment till the next judge comes. We've had that in five different cases. No, I, we, have, we, have no answer to, we have no answer to that. Um, they're now going to be moved to the high court, so at least we hopefully we'll get some progress. Thank you very much. Uh, from the user's point of view, my wish list may be very high, but I'll limit it to eight minutes, which is given to me. I think basically much has been said about what is the problem facing in arbitration in India because most uh, of the earlier speakers have touched upon that. You know. One thing from my user's point of view, with uh, I do admit, you know, what Sharmaji has said that you know when it suits me, I want it to be delayed. You know, I'll ask, you know, whether you know uh, it's a fact, you know, because you know uh, in my earlier institution I was doing an arbitration and you know then we wanted it to be delayed and so we went on as to who will appoint uh, the arbitrator because we judge they give me. 10 names, I reject everything, and I give 10 names, they also reject everything, and ultimately it'll go to the court. And when it went to the court, what the court said is, you know, looking at the amount, it says, okay, the, the arbitrator who was appointed said, you know, I don't have time now, you know, we'll post it in 2015, by the time, you know, I was out of that institution. So that's where it stands, you know, so that, that I do admit that. But the process of, a, I mean, arbitration in India is that it is a very, very lengthy process. And as my early speakers have also said, that judicial intervention at early, every point of time creates a lot of delay. That's when I would say, then I want it to be finished earlier and you know, finish in a very fast manner than the judicial intervention because the other party wants it to be delayed. And I think, uh, as uh, Mr. Adwani said, that you know, district court sitting in judgment over an international arbitration and where you know, he doesn't understand the ABCD of what it is. Because uh, from my practice, of, I mean, from my banking experience, I find that in, even in DRT, where you know, a district judge is called as the presiding officer, 
they have appointed a person who in his entire life was sitting as in the motor accident tribunal. So when I go and tell him that, you know, it's a cash credit, it is a term loan, he will look here and there and said that, you know, okay, uh, when is the next date? You know, I'll give a next date. And he admits that he doesn't understand, you know, so that is where it stands. Then the possibility of getting an award setting aside at any point of time is very high. It is not nothing, the award is not final. You know, nothing becomes final even if I get an award. I don't have the, uh, the, uh, uh, to the, to think that and I got an award and that is going to happen. Then, first and foremost is that, you know, I don't have enough of expert arbitrators to sit in judge. Today what happens is, you know, say we all seek the high court judges or district judges or who are, or the Supreme Court judges. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we all should admit that, you know, maybe during their experience they must have dealt in various issues. But as the earlier speakers in the earlier panel said, that we have, I mean, gone ahead much. And therefore, you know, we need to have experts who know what is happening in each of the, it's a kind of specialized thing, you know, say like doctors specializing in eye and, you know, ENT and, you know, heart specialist and in, even in heart, you know, they, there is a kind of surgery that, like that, you know, we need specialists. That, that is absolutely lacking. And as a result, you know, I'm not satisfied with the award. It's not a fair thing. And therefore, you know, I go in for litigation. Then again, the independence of arbitrators is one question which always uh, is uh, coming in the way. And, you know, we have to shift to institutional arbitration, which I think uh, is now happening. And, you know, I think that is the most essential thing. And, you know, to have a credibility to say that India has a good arbitration then. The other thing is, you know, see, when you have to have a specialized judge when who is to decide under Section 34 of the Arbitration Act in the High Court. Today what happens is, you know, the judges, I mean, it's not going to a particular bench who sits and, you know, hears it. So as a result also, that also gets delayed. And, you know, I would not like to go there and, you know, see that the judge doesn't know anything and, you know, he's not pro-business uh, or, you know, he's not, doesn't understand. So that also is something which uh, needs to be changed. And then need to have expert witness. So. Witnesses are also lacking because, you know, there is a new concept of hot tubbing in the sense, you know, say I bring a witness on a particular issue and he comes and says something as an expert, but that is not the gospel truth. I have to have the right to introduce another expert witness who, witness who can counter his argument or, you know, give a different, uh, altogether a different connotation to the entire issue. Then there should be having a kind of, you know, on the same issue, there should be a two views. Then the arbitrator will be able to understand which one is the correct one or, you know, have a blend of both and then give a good arbit I mean, award. So this happens in, in, I mean, not in an arbitration because, you know, in a, one of the consumer forum cases where I dealt, what happens is, you know, one fellow came and said when there was a phishing attack, he said that the banks are responsible, the bank can have. He was a deputy manager of a nationalized bank. He was introduced there. But we had to produce another person to say that it cannot happen. And, you know, that is where we were able to impress upon the judge that, you know, otherwise, you know, he believes what the deputy manager of a uh, nationalized bank says as the gospel truth. Then use of technology is not happening because, you know, the more, the, most of the arbitrators who are practicing here may be available. It is thousands of pages, volumes, and, you know, you have to have, you know, technology should be accepted and I should not, I mean, I should be allowed to produce things in a soft form and, you know, emails and other things. And, you know, here I have to produce everything in a manner which needs to be in a paper form. That also has to be because, you know, it takes a long time and for that I may seek two months or three months time for that, you know. And from my banking pro point of view, one thing I knew is that today what happens is, you know, the law of surface was enacted in India, which says without the intervention of the court, you know, the, the secured creditor can take over and sell the assets or reconstruct the asset. Because I belong to, I now work in a reconstruction company. The fact of the matter is, at any point of time, the court intervenes. So there is a section called 13.2 where I have to issue notice for 60 days. And after that, you know, if nothing comes, you know, then I can issue 13.4, which is taking physical possession of the assets and I can sell it. I think in between, instead of section 17, which says the right of the, the borrower to go in appeal against my, uh, to go, go and uh, go to the DRT against my uh, action, there should be an arbitration that should be an uh, institutional arbitrator, set of people should be there, retired bankers or, you know, who knows about banking, who should sit in judgment and that should be the final thing. And therefore, in 100%, 90% of the cases which are now pending in DRT for a long time can be settled. 
So my wish list goes on like this. So today, I think unless we move ahead, and you know, when the other countries, like you know, especially Singapore, is moving ahead, and even when I have completed any agreement, you know, nobody wants Indian arbitration. Indian everything is in Singapore. I think unless we move ahead and we make complete change in the uh, in Con arbitration conciliation act, you know, we are not going to reach anywhere. So my wish list is that I think the proposed changes should institutionalize the arbitration and we should move ahead and we should have expert witnesses and wherever it is possible technology should be used and this is where we can achieve and we can say that India is I mean India is a good place to arbitrate because today what happens is even a place like Sri Lanka has come out with an arbitration center and they are also marketing very uh, I mean in a rigorous manner saying that you know that is also a good place for arbitration. So they have a commercial courts there, you know, in, I mean, it's not like India, they have in any banking related issues, you know, they have a commercial court, only that court will deal in it. And there are people who are very, very, I mean, who are experts in commercial business are sitting and manning the judges. So the, the other thing is, you know, intervention of the court at any point of time for anything and everything has to stop. Otherwise, you know, arbitration in India will be a distant dream. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Again, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Daniel, for that uh, introduction. It's been an interesting session. Um, I suppose we have about, uh, each of us have about eight minutes, so let me try and keep to the time. Uh, it's really a privilege to be part of this session with Mr. Chandyok uh, and Mr. Adwani and Gopal Krishnan, Mr. Gopal Krishnan and Daniel. In fact, uh, um, I used to be uh, the Deputy Registrar of the Singapore International Arbitration Center uh, many years ago. We had the privilege of uh, having Mr. Chandyok in uh, one, one of the seminars, one of the most uh, passionate speeches uh, that, that he gave. And uh, a decade later, still, I think he's, uh, he's exactly uh, the same. And about Mr. Adwani as well, uh, I'm sure you all know he's a, he's a great speaker. Uh, Daniel asked me a question, what is the secret? Uh, Singapore uh, you know, is developed as a preferred destination for many Asian parties or, or international parties to locate there. Arbitration, there's, in my view, I think uh, when you compare a country like India and Singapore, it's like, I mean, you really can't compare, um, you know, um, uh, it's like comparing David and the Jan Gold. I mean, it's, it's huge. India is a huge country. Uh, so many stakeholders, the, the kind of litigation that goes on here is, is, is so much. So it will definitely not, I mean, it's, it's very unfair to say, I mean, to compare uh, a huge country like India with a, with a very small jurisdiction uh, like, say, Singapore or Hong Kong. But that said, uh, definitely Singapore has been a very successful venue for, for arbitration. And uh, um, through this presentation, I'm going to kind of highlight some of the, uh, some of the points that I think uh, some food for thought before your, your lunch. I'm sure they get preparing that uh, very soon. First, I'll deal with what Singapore has to offer generally as a place. And then I'll briefly discuss about arbitration, Singapore, the arbitration landscape there. And I will talk about the SIAC, and I'll also discuss some unique features, uh, one or two of, uh, interesting features in the new SIAC rules. Uh, most of this, I'm sure many of you have visited Singapore. Um, it's a strong multicultural society with uh, excellent legal and technological expertise, as well as uh, language fluency, which is very much like any of the cosmopolitan cities in India. It's centrally located in Southeast Asia, so if you're in Singapore, you can use that as a hub for all the 10 uh, Southeast Asian countries with almost 6,200 scheduled flights uh, every week to about uh, 250 cities across the world. It is an open economy and business environment, that, and it hosts about 14,000 multinational companies and firms. There's a strong tradition of the rule of law, like in India. It's supported by a highly skilled and respected judiciary. It is an international dispute resolution hub, not just for arbitration. You have the Singapore International Arbitration Center. Last year, they launched the Singapore International Mediation Center, which is called the SIMC. And there's, this year, in January, they launched the Singapore International Commercial Court. Mr. Gopal Krishnan was talking about the commercial court in Sri Lanka. Uh, similarly, Singapore has launched a commercial court topic in itself uh, for a different day, I guess, but uh, many of you will be probably interested in what the commercial court does. So quickly, arbitration in Singapore, um, uh, you know, it's a dual-track arbitral regime, unlike in India, which has a single legislation for arbitration. In Singapore, we have two laws. One is for the domestic arbitration, which is called the Arbitration Act. Then there's the International Arbitration Act, which adopts the Institutional Model Law, 
and uh, part three of the act uh, deals with foreign awards and New York Convention awards and how you enforce it. There's definitely a pro-arbitration policy. Um, you know, we say, we, we talk about Indian judgments and say, you know, there have been issues. I mean, there were also issues with Singapore High Court judgments uh, 10 years ago, and uh, then the legislature had to step in and amend the laws. But the only thing in Singapore is the amendments are very quick. Uh, the parliament steps in and uh, makes sure the legislation is in, um, is, is kind of in uh, sync with the most of the best practices around the world. There is maximum court support and uh, minimum judicial intervention by the judiciary in arbitral process. There is open door policy in Singapore. I'm um, sure, I mean, many of you must have heard of the Maxwell Chambers, which is a state-of-the-art facility in Singapore. Many of, many of them here, I'm sure Mr. Adwani, Mr. Prasanna, quite a lot of them have uh, conducted arbitrations at the Maxwell Chambers. It's a real state-of-the-art facility in Asia. If you go to Singapore, I would strongly recommend you to visit the Maxwell Chambers. When I talk about open door policy, there is also other, other useful things to note that for foreign arbitrators and foreign counsel, you don't need a work permit to come and arbitrate and uh, present your arbitration case on behalf of your clients in Singapore. So that's, that's one advantage. There's no withholding of tax on arbitrators' fees as well. So these are all uh, things that have been done by the uh, Singapore government as well as the players in the arbitration field to make it a really friendly jurisdiction. Now, moving on to SIAC, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, it's a relatively young institution, uh, about 24 years old, established in July 1991 as a non-profit, non-governmental organization. It is a neutral and independent institution, very good track record of managing international arbitration cases. Like last year, in 2014, there were 222 new cases filed, and for the past three years, the SIC has been receiving over 200 cases, uh, consolidating its position as one of the world's leading arbitration centers. More than the number of cases, we look at the amount in dispute. The total sum in dispute for the cases filed last year was, was about 5.04 billion Singapore dollars, which makes the average value of an SIC dispute at 23.65 million, which is, which is quite uh, substantial. And 81% of the new cases last year were international, and many of the cases don't have any connection to Singapore. Parties just come and choose Singapore as the venue. Uh, and it has a very good set of rules. The SIAC rules, which is the latest edition, is the 2013 rules. Um, under these rules, there were certain things that happened uh, to the SIAC. Earlier, there was a board of directors, but now there's also a court of arbitration, which is uh, nothing but a private court, a group of people. Uh, which consists of leading uh, international arbitration practitioners from around the world. The board of directors were also revamped uh, to include commercial law experts and arbitration practitioners. The fee is not by the hour that you pay the arbitrator. It's ad valorem. It uh, depends on what your amount in dispute is, which is the claim and counterclaim put together. The secretariat also looks at the draft award. Uh, it doesn't interfere with the decision, but it look at things like you know basic uh, structure of the award, make sure the reasons are given, the costs are dealt with, the interest is dealt with, so on and so forth. Um, there are certain unique provisions of the SIAC rules which have been very attractive to Asian parties, which are essentially the expedited procedure and the emergency arbitrator. Uh, rule 5 of the SIAC rules deal with the expedited procedure. If your dispute does not exceed 5 million Singapore dollars of the party agree, or if there's an exceptional emergency, you can apply to the SIAC for the expedited procedure to apply. You could also agree well in advance in your contract for the expedited procedure to apply, but if not, you can apply after the arbitration commences. If this application is granted, then a sole arbitrator would be appointed and you can expect an arbitra arbitration award within six months unless it's extended, but typically most of the um, awards under this expedited procedure are made within six months. An interesting and very important provision which has been very attractive to Indian parties is the provision dealing with an emergency arbitrator. SIAC was the first institution in Asia to introduce the emergency arbitrator provision. You can apply to the SIAC after you commence an arbitration for urgent interim measures and appointment of an emergency arbitrator. If the application is allowed by the president of the court, then within one business day, you'll get your emergency arbitrator who shall within two business days appoint a schedule and you know, deal with the application. Just one or two case studies under the EA provisions, um, you know, which was under the 2010 rules, which is very similar to the new rules. As expected, the first case was between first ever emergency arbitrator provision was invoked by two Indian parties at the SIAC. 
uh, where the claimant sought emergency relief by way of an injunction to restrain the respondent from invoking guarantees. The application was received at night at 9.30 p.m. and uh, by 11.30 a.m. the next morning, the emergency arbitrator was appointed. And within one day of his appointment, he established a schedule and directed the parties to make submissions and within a week, he dealt with the application. In a second party, in the second case, also involving an Indian party and, a, and the other side was a BVI party. The, um, the arbitrator was appointed within 20 hours of the application and within uh, almost three days of his appointment, a decision was made in, in, in those cases. Um, why is it very attractive to Indian parties is something which we need to bear in mind. A lot of the requests have come from Indian parties to the SISC for appointment of an emergency arbitrator. That's because of the, I think it's a culture of Indian parties to go to court for interim measures in their arbitration. So they, when they have such a provision in the SIAC rules, they're very happy to invoke it. Also, the impact of the Balco decision, which prospectively excludes the power of Indian courts to grant interim measures to arbitration seated outside is another reason why they go to the emergency arbitrator. And there's also been judicial endorsement uh, by the Indian courts of the emergency arbitrator provisions. For example, uh, in HSBC and Avital Post, the Bombay High Court, in exercise of its jurisdiction to grant interim measures of protection, directed relief in terms of the award made by an emergency arbitrator under the SIC rules. This was a judgment given last year and a very progressive judgment in, in my view. These are general pointers which I'm sure there are a lot of in-house counsel here. When you choose a place of arbitration, you know, there's section 44 in the Indian Act and the, the only those awards made in territories which are notified in the official gazette are uh, arbitra foreign awards. So make sure you choose a country which is on that gazette. There are 153 parties to the New York Convention, but I understand only about 46 have been notified by the central government in India. Therefore, parties should consider choosing a place which is on that list if they envisage the award to be enforced in India. A main advantage is for Indian parties. I mean, we've heard so much about Indian parties choosing Singapore as opposed to the traditional way of going to London for international arbitration. One is proximity. You can be in Singapore from Delhi in about five hours. Uh, very close cultural ties. There's a lot of uh, Indian food if you've come to Singapore. Um, you know, where you, you can enjoy the same thing uh, as we enjoy in India in terms of food, culture. In fact, Diwali is a public holiday in India, in, in Singapore, sorry. So, you know, it's so much of uh, in the Indian uh, culture there. And both Singapore and India follow the common law tradition. In fact, some of the laws in Singapore are replicas of Indian laws, like the Penal Code and the Evidence Act. It was, though it's British India, it's exactly the same. It's very close to Indian law that way. And both are parties to the New York Convention, and uh, as already mentioned, Indian parties have been the highest users of SIAC arbitration for the past uh, five years, and last year about 37 cases involved Indian parties. And year before last was a bumper crop, there were about 85 cases in 2013 that involved an Indian uh, party. Uh, this is a model clause, um, I'm not going to go through it, you can look at it on the website to make sure you have a model clause in your contract, not just SIAC or ICC, whatever you choose, please use a model clause. Daniel was mentioning about the midnight clause where you look at the dispute resolution clause when, you, when you're just ready to go home. So please don't do that. If you, if you need to engage a lawyer, it's a small fee, much better than what you would have to pay if the dispute arises and you have a pathological clause. And also please have an applicable law clause in the contract and save if it's governed by Indian law or Singapore law or English law, because if you don't, then the tribunal has to again decide this issue as, um, you know, we'll look at it uh, from the point of private international law and conflict of laws and decide which law has the closest connection. This is what has happened in Singapore in, in, in brief, and I'll be happy to take questions uh, later or during lunch. And uh, I'm sure I would like to end it on a positive note, Daniel, like Ms. Chandyok said. I think, see, India is, is, in my view, a fantastic jurisdiction. In fact, some of the judgments of the Supreme Court of India are one of, one of the best in the world in several areas in human rights or rule of law or you know, even commercial law. So let's be very positive about it. Mr. Adwani spoke about the amendments uh, that the Arbitration Act, you know, they're going to uh, amend the act. Hopefully it goes through. And uh, I think uh, I would like to conclude by, by quoting what uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru in his famous Twist of Destiny speech on 15th of August, 1947. He said, long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. I think India is not just awakened, awoken to life and freedom, but you see any area, India is now progressing. So, yes, 
we, we should make in India, but I think to make it a success, I'm sure there are a lot of positive vibes. On that positive note, I'm sure India will be a world-class location for dispute resolution, not in years to come, but in very shortly. And that's the positive note I have. Thank you so much.